You're listening to The Dirt on the Past, a show on history and archaeology and why it matters today. You can find us on the Extreme History Project website and also on kgbm.org. Thanks for listening. Welcome to The Dirt on the Past from the Extreme History Project and KGBM Community Radio. Whether digging up a site or dusting off the archives, we bring you some of the most fascinating and cutting-edge research in history and archaeology and discuss why it matters today. Join me, Nancy Mahoney, alongside co-host Crystal Alegria, as we converse with anthropologists, archaeologists, and historians about how they bring the past alive. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we are the co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. This week, an archaeologist who has excavated at the site of Nibelivka, one of several large settlements in Ukraine known as the Trapillion Megasites, which are very likely some of the first cities anywhere on Earth, um, will be with us today. She is one of several researchers thinking about the origins of urbanism in this part of the world, which may appear to be settlements that do not have kings or temples or other trappings of complex civilization. So we are so excited today to talk with Dr. Bizirka Gedarska. But first, Crystal, what do you have planned for this weekend coming up? Well, you know, um, graduation, um, high school graduation is top of my mind right now oh, because yeah. um, my son and your daughter are yeah. graduating in Yay! just a couple weeks. I know. <laughs> These are our babies, our I last know, ones. Our last ones yeah. graduating from high school. So mm-hmm. um, so it's been, um, I've been thinking a lot about that. And this weekend I'm going to devote to planning, graduation party, and all those sorts of things. So um, Wonderful. So, yeah. Thinking a lot about um, high school graduation and a little bit um, sad about that, but it's yeah, happy as well. It's exciting. And yeah. it'll be a whirlwind of different um, parties that yeah. the parents and the kids all go to. And it's so great to be able to see everybody. And how nice that at least this year, it, without any COVID sort of restrictions yes, on know. a lot of this. So yeah. we're we're grateful. And um, and it'll be on a Saturday, which is yeah. a change. It used to be on a Sunday. So I know. it'll be kind of an interesting. So it is kind of fun in that way. And, and it'll be nice to, you know... Um, my daughter graduated in 2020, so she didn't get any of this. She didn't get right. the party. She didn't. So this is kind of the first time that I'm doing some of this. So exactly, Aiden didn't have anything yeah, either. Yeah. Same year, mm-hmm. and um, and I, you know, this is our my first and only go around with the right. big graduation whirlwind. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to make it good. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we'll see how it all comes together. <laughs> well, good, good. I'll be yeah. following your yeah. lead. Yeah. What about you, Nancy? Well, this weekend I think we're going to actually open the men's store. Uh, yeah. officially Officially on Saturday, and it's lovely because all kinds of people are in town for for MSU's graduation, right, right. and um, I think it'll be nice to um, actually open about the 20 boxes that came yesterday oh, and fun. get them all out on the floor. And I'm really excited to see what people think. So yeah. that'll keep me a little bit busy um, with that. All right. Well, that's been great. So now we should probably turn back to our guest for today. We should. And we're so glad to have you with us here today, Bazerka. Welcome. Love <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. And and um, we're on Zoom today um, in the KGVM headquarters with you, but we have a good picture and no lag time, so we're excited. Yeah. And Bazerka, what we always do is start off by telling our listeners a little bit about you. So Dr. Bizirka Gedarska um, is an honorary fellow in archaeology in the Department of Archaeology in Durham University in England, where she received her PhD. Gedarska's primary research interests include the prehistory of Central and Southeastern Europe, focusing on material culture studies, identity, early urbanism, and GIS, which is Geographic Information Systems and Landscape Archaeology. These interests have involved and taken her on numerous field trips and research projects, including excavations and museum work in her home country of Bulgaria, as well as in Romania, Greece, Serbia, Hungary, and the Ukraine. Dr. Gedarska's major publications include Parts and Holes, Fragmentation in Prehistoric Context with John Chapman, published by Oxford in 2007, and Early Urbanism in Europe, The Case of the Triplia Megasites. She's the author and main editor, and that was published in 2020. Since 2019, 
Dr. Gelarska has been the co-chair of Archaeology and Gender in Europe and uh, the Community of European Association of Archaeologists. Well, welcome. Impressive, impressive credentials there. <laughs> so we want to start off by asking you a little bit about how you got into the field of archaeology and really how you became interested in this work that you've done with megasites. Well, that will be a surprise for you that archaeology was not my childhood dream. I very often people say, oh, that I was always wanted to be an archaeologist. For me, it was different. I actually made a mature choice. I became uh, started my studies at the age of 23 in Sofia University, as you quite rightly said. But that was really what I decided that I wanted to do at the later stage of my life, more mature. And I never regretted that choice, uh, even when it was very difficult. I never looked back and I'm, I'm really happy of what I'm doing. So as you quite rightly pointed from my CV, I'm what we will call a European prehistorian. But my narrow specialism is really the prehistory of Southern and Eastern Europe. And I've always known about these sites in Ukraine because this was part of the curriculum. But uh, I never thought that I actually will be involved in, 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 their, uh, in excavating or being really, really part of, of uh, their rediscovery, if you wish. And it was in 2003 when I had a, a field work in Romania that we were invited to go to uh, Ukraine for a conference that was part of for, uh, that was devoted to these um, sites. And that was my first time when I actually saw them. And it's that, that kind of stays with you. Uh, and, I, and again, even in 2003, I didn't think that I one day will be back doing something, uh, some field work uh, with these sites. And it was in 2007 in Durham when uh, Professor Roland Fletcher came here as a visiting fellow of the um, Institute for Advanced Studies. And he uh, has been long interested in settlement trajectories or how the settlement develops worldwide. And these sites were an exception of his model of how these sites, were, of how uh, generally humankind um, developed its settlement forms. And when we were celebrating one of his, everything happens in a pub, of course, when we're celebrating one of his promotions, he looked at us and said, oh, why don't you do something about these sites, them being the inception of his model? And that kind of really interested us and said, well, let's let's give it a go. So in 2009, we had a small pilot, pilot funding small pilot study with a little bit of geophysics just to see what's going to happen. Is it going to work? And it's just the luck of the beginners, you know, and we, it was absolutely amazing. And because during that early geophysics, geophysical work we discovered uh, what we now know is the biggest structure the biggest house if you wish the biggest uh, dwelling um or public house uh of that culture of the tripelians and um, we didn't know that at the time but it was obviously there was a lot of potential so obviously that brought the next application round of applications for a much bigger grant and lo and behold, in 2012, we started our field work in Ukraine from, two, from 2012 to 2014. Uh, we did uh, our investigations and that's... I love, I love knowing that these sites um, started out as sort of the exception to somebody's model because they certainly sound like they have been. And I've been teaching um, at the Montana State University for a while, and we always go over sort of origins of um, farming and civilization. And you always talk about V. Gordon Child and the agricultural revolution and the urban revolution. And, and we know those models aren't quite right, but there's nothing like these Tripian sites that really blow them out of the water. So I am ridiculously excited uh, to discuss these mega sites with you because it's just one of these things that um, I've always been fascinated with, trying to understand how power and inequality become established in societies. And we know that there can be small scale societies that have inequality in terms of power or control over economic resources, but when they become entrenched and we see such evidence of them archeologically, it fascinates me at what point did somebody be able to not only 
have power, but then maintain it and, and really change a cultural form that's replicated over and over again, which we so much associate with sort of those early Mesopotamian cities, which have been sort of that model. So I first came across your research and research particularly in Ukraine in the book, The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and David Wengro. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. And I've been having so much fun reading this book, but they discuss exactly as you said, how these mega sites in Ukraine challenge these traditional understandings of this urban revolution as imagined by V. Gordon Child and others, which postulates that the first cities that ever showed up on the planet kind of had this trait list of elements. They had political centralization, economic specialization, and centralization. Amazing architecture, which implies a lot of engineering and sophistication, a writing or record keeping system, evidence of elites, centralized planning, a military storage of surplus food necessary to feed all these people who aren't farming for themselves anymore. So all of those um, things and that these urban centers were really fed by a hinterland of farmers and they relied on long distance trade and trade going into the center. So that's been the traditional model. This is not what it looks like at all in Ukraine. And these sites are even earlier than the Mesopotamian ones. So I just think this is fascinating because it it makes us question what we think about how humans can conceive of themselves as part of larger societies and live together um, in a place where we see some uniformity in structures. We see like what we would imagine is cultural cohesion. So we're going to unpack all this as we go through today. But um, getting back to V. Gordon Child, we know his ideas were based on urban settlements in Mesopotamia, the city of Uruk, or the early centers that date back 5,000 years ago. So Ukraine's early cities appear to be as we said, settlements without kings and other trappings of civilization. So now I'll finally get to a question. Uh, We have a lot to dive into here. Can you just start with a basic description of what one of these Tripian megasites looks like, the size of it, where they're located, um, as well as a little bit about how they were first interpreted when um, we had Eastern Bloc scholars studying them in the 1970s, because over here in America, I heard a lot less about them, so they're a lot less well known to to me. And I think part of it is because they also didn't fit into these classic models. So I'll turn it over to you. It's yeah, you're absolutely right. And the site, the, the Tripilia itself, like a, a, a group, a, a prehistoric society, was known since the uh, 1890s. So the first site of Tripilia was discovered as early as then. As then. However, these big sites come on the scene slightly later and about in the late 60s, in the early 70s, which is a period that we call the first um, the first uh, uh, methodological revolution, is um, that air photography, which probably was very uh, popular in, in, in the West, but not so much in, in the Eastern Bloc. So it was by aerial photography that they kind of noticed these outlines of these very weird sites which then were followed by what I usually call the granddad of modern geophysics, which actually was considering the conditions in which was them, they were actually pretty, pretty uh, accurate for, for the time being. And of course, nobody knew of what um, date that might be. So a little bit of excavation followed. And then that obviously discovered, that, that put it in the, um, the Tripilia uh, culture as they are known. <clears throat> and they also uh, uh, realized that all this uh, uh, geophysics actually is a result of burnt remains. Because as you know, where geophysics works is when there is a, um, either uh, the soil, the, 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 the mm, texture of the soil is changed, that gives a signal, there, or there is a peak, or when there is a very strong uh, magnetic signal, which suggests some kind of burning. So these are the kind of two types of anom- anomalies that we can pick with geophysics. And the what we call a second phase of uh, of methodological revolution is when in two thousands when these um, international projects started to appear, like the ones that I was uh, taking part of, which is the Durham University one for the site of Nebelivka, or which the team of Kiel University has excavated in the site site of my, the Net Square. And these are the periods in which modern geophysics came into Ukraine. 
and also um, a lot of interdisciplinary studies. So we did paleoenvironmental investigations. We also did a lot of uh, radiocarbon datings. So this is the kind of uh, modernized the way in which these sites were um, looked at. What lagged and what we were trying to address in this uh, 2020 book is catching up with theoretical model, how to explain these sites. Because they are taken very traditionally in terms of cultural history um, um, approach in which they are just big villages. They're just described as big villages, what's in them. They have pottery. They have domesticated animals and and some plants. Right. Having said that, the people which we, we, with which we worked, and that's why we embarked on that, and I suppose for which we were, received the funding, is that there were these, these voices, so very few and far between, in the Ukrainian, um, uh, primarily Ukrainian, not so much Russian literature, that they may represent some kind of proto-cities. So that was the thing that actually hooked us for that. And But we were really trying to do it properly bottom up. Obviously, very soon we realized that using criteria like you just described, it will be very difficult to deal with these sites. So we needed a new, fresh approach uh, to that. And this, uh, and you're absolutely right. You would not know them because majority of the publications till we started in 2000, the, the, the international teams, was in Russian and Ukrainian. Very few, Which, very few. Surprisingly, I do not speak, you know, but yeah, as most Americans <laughs> Very few in English or very uh, in German, but that will be it. So if, if you happen to know these languages, you probably would know, but really not, uh, not really. David Anthony had touched on his, in some of his books because he deals with that part of the, of the world, but that's it. So very traditional approach to them with some voices voicing something different and basically everything starting from 2000 onwards it's really both theoretically and methodologically trying to present these sites to the world in a different light fascinating i mean i love that part of the history give us a brief description too of like what they look like and how big they are because you refer to them as like they're these mega sites they're they thought they were villages and then you use the word proto cities so so just physically tell us what one looks like. Uh, well, if you look at the, at the plan. Yeah, uh, which, Hallmark, which we have, but our listeners can't see, but, but we'll <laughs> put it up. Yeah. That's exactly the, the, the shortcomings of, of, of a podcast is that you can't see them, but you will see a huge empty space in the middle, which is defined by house circuits. And we know that it's houses because we uh, Ukrainians have excavated it ever since they have been discovered they have excavated sites, uh, or parts of sites, I would say. And that's why we know that these are houses. They are usually concentric houses, uh, uh, concentric circuits, as we call it, circuits of houses. They vary from two, like in the Belivka, but they can be up to seven, like in my Donetsko. Okay, so in other words, links- almost like tree rings, there can be at least two Correct. rings and then an empty space in the center, or there could be seven concentric rings and they're they're domestic structures we know people were living in them they're not empty or except as you mentioned some of these larger ones so i'll yes go back to you yes there are and there are also pits so these are the kind of things that we discovered in in the latest uh, with the good geophysics with the high precision geophysics we confirmed the first principles which were uh all even the old geophysics has identified these concentric this concentric principle they identified that probably these are with some empty middle, there would be concentric circles, and there will be space between the circuits. They're not touching each other. There is a circle. So that was established very early on. What we managed to establish, uh, we, we and the Germans, I mean, is with the, 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 the precision, uh, the, the precise geophysics, is that there is ditches which around, uh, surround the site, that there are also paleo channels, they're burnt and unburned houses so that was an, a surprise we didn't know that they exist so these weird structures which we call mega structures because they're really big much bigger than the usual the usual house we also discovered pits pit clusters and what bound uh, uh, bound unbuilt spaces which for you and me is a square plaza as the americans usually say and we also managed we, what we think is neighborhoods and quarters. That's what we kind of we try to 
see some special division, which we, in, in again, in our modern terms, will call neighborhoods and quarters. So the whole so, site is circular, and y- you have concentric... Oval. Right, oval, oval, I would say. Oval. And houses that are facing in towards the center, and yet then, almost like in these pie shapes, you've been able to delineate kind of residential quarters or neighborhoods or something that radiate yeah. out. So there's many levels then of what appears to be social organization within the site. And then there isn't just one of these sites, right? There's several of the these Chippean mega sites on in Ukraine. Correct. Yeah, okay. Correct. Depending on how many uh there there's still debates whether uh, uh the, 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 the the where do you put the the boundary, what is big? So because mega means big. So do you put it at a hundred hectares and above, but then what happens in between? What happens between the sites which are between 10 and 100? They're still very big, but probably not, not as mega. So there is that, that debate. And secondly, there is also the debate how many of these, uh, how many sites there are, because generally in, in the Tripilia uh, group. So with these kind of caveats, we can say that the mega sites are between 2 and 5%. Of all known Chupilia sites. Okay, right. two to five so percent are these sense. larger, but so there are several of them, but they're not the majority by any means. Okay, yeah. no. okay, but two to five no. percent is quite a bit as well. So, yeah. so between two and five, which is which is quite quite a bit. So that's why we are looking at a form which is not your usual form. That's why the large village model kind of doesn't really fit because it is really standing out as a way of living, which is not your usual, your norm, if you wish, of uh, of, of 10 to 20 uh, houses organized in the same way, in the concentric circle, but without the middle empty area, which for us is the core. This is a congregation area for which we think these sites actually have been founded. That's what they see. The reason was that central area. Okay. All right. So, um, so many of these Tropillion mega sites are located in the uh, forest step environment, which is located just north of the Black Sea. And the largest of these sites, when you're talking about this um, Bizerka, is over a square mile large. And so that's um, just for reference, that's about four times the size of Vatican City. And then for those of us who are living in Montana, that's about the size of our town, Big Timber. So if you think about that, that's, you know, that's huge. Um, and, you know, there's other mega sites and other um other of these sites, maybe not mega sites, but other of these sites that are located not too far away, like six to eight miles away. So that's what you were just talking about. So it really takes a lot to feed hundreds of thousands of people a year, especially if they're residing in one location most of that year. So kind of residing in this this one mega site area. So tell us about the environment where the mega sites are found, that forest step environment, and why you think it became the location of these first large scale settlements about 6,000 years ago. How was it able to support these large numbers of early farmers before anywhere else really on the entire planet? Uh, well, forest step, it depends whether you put the step or the forest first. So, basi- But basically, whichever lo- way you look at it, it will be a grassland with patches of, of deciduous forest. Or the other way around, it will be an open woodland with patches of grassland. In either case, however, this is a very good place for farming because of the uh, wide availability of, uh, of, 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 of land for farming. Currently, obviously, that's not the case because there is a modern agriculture, so you do not recognize the the, the past the past uh, landscapes there. But generally, that would be how the these environments would look like. I was listening very carefully that you are the way you're phrasing your questions, and you know I have been asked this many many times, and people really phrase it in a such a way because we started exactly the same way. We say, okay, big sites, there must be big impact. And in order to see the impact, we said, okay, how do we find out what these people were eating? How are they supporting themselves? 
So one of the classic ways of doing that in archaeology, as you know, is you do a pollen call, you do an uh, in parallel environmental analysis to tell you what the things, how how these they, they, they how they are doing about their daily business. So we are expecting that there will be this huge environmental impact. There would be this. Uh, uh, species which are uh, uh, cereals uh, that will give them their diet. You were expecting that. And what was our surprise when the results from the pollen diagram came and there was nothing in the salt. So there were five different indicators, which was there was no fall in pollen tree and uh, tree pollen. So there was no forest deforestation, which we were expecting. Uh, there were no peaks in cereal pollen because that if there are peaks in cereal pollen, that means that they they are doing quite a bit of uh, agriculture. There was no peaks in, um, or rather, there were peaks, but outside the, the, the occupation in the Belivka of micro charcoal, which will suggest the, the cycles of burning because these houses, as I mentioned, in order to be identified, they were burned structures, so we knew that they were burning. There was nothing to indicate that there was such huge, massive fires. And would, that would uh, the implication would be there was no evidence for erosion because again, many people, many hoofs, many uh, um, agriculture. So that in, that a large scale habitation will produce a lot of impact of erosion. None of that. And the fifth indicator was the. Uh, the quality of the water, which we couldn't find anything which suggests poor quality of the water. So that was a, and what do we do now? A, a, a pause. Uh, and then evidence, it is what it is. You have to take it at a face value. So we had to rethink very carefully all these traditional, all year round, big site occupation. We had to come up with some other explanation of what was going on. And because it was so innovative and so different, we were not really very comfortable with offering one picture saying that's it. Because we, we think that more needs to be done to pinpoint exactly what was going around and we are making strides towards as, as we speak. But we can for for the site of Nebelivka, we came with three different models trying to explain what was going on in these sites. So one model indeed sees a permanent occupation, but on a smaller scale. The other two models are envisaging a more um, uh, episodic and seasonal occupation, one being a pilgrimage model and the other being an, like an assembly model. And all, what all of these four models, uh, sorry, three models needed to account for when we were creating it, basically building and burning, uh, uh, we were basically building and burning uh, structure. So we needed to produce uh, the footprint of almost 1500 structures. So we needed to work with these parameters. We needed to have 1,770 1, 7, 1, houses that were burned. The rest were unburned, so we had to cater for that. We also needed to not have a huge impact. So whatever we were doing, we should account that there would be no huge impact. And also we knew that the site was occupied between 150 and 200 years. And none of these houses would have been occupied for that long period. So therefore, the cycles of, of, of building houses should match that. So we, we needed, so whatever the radiocarbon dates were suggesting in terms of contemporary um, uh, um, houses would be needed to fit that. So these are the things that we used to create these three models. Okay. Right. So if let me recap just to make sure we're understanding so that you're really not seeing much impact on the environment that you would expect if people were farming and feeding thousands of people that might have been living there at the same time, like we do see in other places where we have these dense urban settlements, erosion, water quality, and then the burning that we see in some of these sites, especially the big sites, is intense, but there's no other evidence for large scale environmental fires, or deforestation, or fires that would have happened if something caught fire naturally in a forest. Okay, so none of that. So we that's our first clue. And then you're saying we have a lot of these houses 
houses. And we know the site is occupied over a 200 year period, but it might not be contemporaneous occupation. It's hard to get that really fine grain radiocarbon data so that it seems like it makes sense to also consider these alternative models where maybe there was a a small resident population and some people were making pilgrimages periodically or assembling seasonally. Okay, but that's still a lot of building yeah, and a yeah. lot of people. Let a me just of- ask about, because I know that you said there's some cereals that are being grown and then from excavations in the pits, do you get a sense of um, animals, other things they were eating that we know oh, yeah. might have been using uh, to feast or something if they were gathering? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, we, we do. And and, and there are the, the, the range of species that you find in the pollen diagram and the range of animals that you see we find deposited around is the same like you find on small sites or where you find across Europe. So they don't differ really. So they, they did cultivate wheat and barley and rye. So these are really part of, uh, of, of the same Neolithic package that we have across. So they, in that sense, they were not different in any way. Uh, and they will have the same uh, animals as, as would have the, 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 uh, the, 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 the origin of where these people came is obviously debated, but it sums probably from the Balkans. So you, you, you're seeing these people bringing the same kind of knowledge and the same kind of uh, uh, f- uh, plants and animals with them. So in that sense, they don't differ at all. Only they uh, do it in a very sustainable matter, uh, manner. And we, we would have never, ever known that if it wasn't for, for that uh, pollen diagram. So yeah, uh, well, cattle, uh, sheep, goat, a little bit of horse, not many, but yeah, there are, there are, there are a bit of horse about. So yes, it's it's the same animals which you would find. And, and again, with time, more domesticates. So you see the same patterns, less wild and more domesticates, like everywhere in the world. In that sense, they don't present anything different. It's just the management of that. Right. How did they do that? How did they manage it? 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 And then no, no evidence that one house um, has more than the other Mm -hmm. or that there was one central structure, be it a temple or palace where it was being stored Mm -hmm. or, you know, managed by any. Maybe we will come later to, you know, to to one of these big houses that we excavated, you know, in anticipation that, you know, know, we we will find find something. something. Um, Yeah. um, Yeah. um, it didn't happen. I mean, yeah, so, but let's not preempt. It hasn't <laughs> happened. And so no. far, these sites look very different from these early Mesopotamian cities, such as Uruk, where you have a ziggurat in the middle, you have these temples, and you do see evidence of already like a, a class structure and all this economic specialization of who makes what and then exchanges it. And there's a recording system and eventually a writing system. Um, so more on that, let me take a quick station break and, and then we'll continue to talk. You are listening to The Dirt on the Pass with co-hosts Crystal Alegria and Nancy Mahoney on KGVM Bozeman or wherever you find your podcasts. We are speaking today with Dr. Bezurka Gedarska about her work on the origins of the Tripilian megasites and perhaps new origins for urban uh, sites. So now that we kind of know what these sites look like... um, what what can you and your team interpret about the social, political, and economic organization from your research that you've done at this site, both from the physical layout of the built environment and the remains of the daily life or ceremonial activities, if you could um, recognize that? And you talk a little bit, you talked a little bit before about the intentional burning of the houses, which seems to occur at all of these sites. So maybe you could specifically even talk to speak to that and how the burning of these houses, kind of going back to that sustainability idea, really takes, you know, they weren't just burning the houses as they were. They had to um, put more wood in them to actually make them burn to the ground. So that's interesting, fascinating as well. So if you could speak to that, Bazerka, that'd be great. Maybe I'll start with that with the last sent- with the last question first about the, uh, the 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 intentional burning. So I don't know to what extent your uh, listeners would know that there is a huge debate in European prehistory about um, deliberate versus non-deliberate or like accidental uh, house burning, 
because this is a, a feature in uh, European prehistory. So Trepilia are not the only group that has uh, evidence, that they have evidence for burning of houses. And the debate is huge about whether that has happened because uh, a hostile attack, accidental fires, or whether that has been deliberate. It's so, similar to in southwestern yeah, sites. Yeah. There you, go. you talked about that as well. So yeah, we'll, we'll get back yeah. to that. But exactly. And it's, yeah. it's often a debate. But when you see it so often there, you start yeah. to get this sense that there's something ritual, ceremonial and, and definitely intentional about it. Well, that's why we did we did an experiment, because, you know, the only way to I mean, uh, there were experiments before ours as well. So may no mistake that, you know, we are not the first one to do experiments, but we did it very methodically with recording and what we really wanted to see is because we wanted to do the experiment and then go and excavate the experiment to see what um, what are the remnants, how the excav- what we are excavating, and how does this relate to the actual uh, excavation results? And that that's, that was for us the best way to find out or to put at least for that group to put an end to that debate. Although I have to say that as far as the Tupila group is concerned, everybody is agreeing that that's probably it, it was intentional and deliberate. So we needed to really absolute packed the, 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 the experimental house that we built. Then we packed it with, uh, with a lot of fuel, wood, and then we burned it and then we excavated it. And what we found, and we have published extensively on that, is that it really matched. So in order to, re- to, to produce the same kind of remnants that we find in the, in the site itself, the only way to do that is to do it like we did it. Because if you don't do it like that, the implications is that you have these unburned or weakly burned houses, we, which we now know do exist on the site. So, the, so obviously there was a two cut kinds of behavior. It wasn't just one. So there are people who wanting this to happen and it happened. And for other structures, for whatever reason, they did not do that. That there was a real choice there, and it, that kind of burning it does not happen only on the mega sites. It also happens on small sites. So this is really a quintessential practice. This is what we think is one of the uh, 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 one of the uh, elements that unites uh, the, that huge group, that enormous Trubilia group, is is this house burning. So uh, that's uh, going then from there. Uh, that would have been one of the major ceremonies that would have happened on that site. And uh, in each of our three models, we, we envisage that to have been a central, a central um, unifying act, act which serves to unite the, 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 um, the, the whoever was living there, whether that would be pilgrims, whether that will be a... Um, uh, the assembly model, which probably your listeners will more easily relate to Burning Man. It's even burning involving in that sort of thing. So it, it pairs perfectly. And in the, the in the more permanent model the, 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 with the small occupation, the, this is again is, is what happens on smaller sites. So in all of these, the burning of the houses was central. That was really, really one of the things that was happening there. Another thing that was happening there is obviously feasting. Because feasting, uh, we have these huge pits that we now know from the geophysics and we did investigate it. And the amount of animal bone in there is just enormous, which also suggests that there has been a some kind of celebration, so, uh, which uh, involved a lot of eating and drinking, and memorialization of that by bearing it in. So you're creating some kind of uh, the, uh, memory of that event by putting everything in the ground. Uh, so we, we have evidence for that. And so coming back, I'm going to slowly to uh, uh, gradually to the various things that the practices that have been, we know that has happened place in, 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 in the Belivka. When we excavated uh, the, the house that we discovered in 2009, which currently remains probably the biggest structure in fourth millennium Europe. I mean, unless something comes again, maybe in our, across Europe. But it is about 56 to 60, uh, depending where you look at it, long and about between 20 and 22 meters wide. So and is, this, is this is, timber and wattle and dog? What is the, or is there stone? Yes. This is in, in, uh, an amazing uh, piece of architecture that early on, because 
how do you roof it? So if you go and do in our in, in our book, we do discuss the various way of how that probably has been built and how it was. The problem was the roofing, not so much that. So, but it, it, yes, it is bottle and daub. That's how it is. It's bottle and daub. Nothing more sophisticated than that. And we were expect because this was really huge. We are expecting to be temple, and you will see in the literature um, that it has been interpreted as temple. And it kind of is backed by uh, the, the number of altars or what we call platforms in, in uh, distributed across the place in that. So there are suggestions for that. However, there was nothing to suggest any kind of accumulation because if there is some kind of um, hierarchical society or that would have been the house of a big man or if that would be a temple, which will have some kind of um, uh, storage facility, something to suggest that there is a redistribution of goods. None of that, none of that we found. What we found was that counts as a really, really exceptional, ah, exceptional, different from what you find if you're excavating a normal house, is a teeny weeny pieces of gold, which we think is a, it's a hair ornament, okay. and a set of miniature vessels which we think are probably personal personal drinking cups. So it could be related to some kind of ritual around some of these altars and, you know, doing some kind of uh, 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 ceremonies that we know very little about. And so that's what we think, that this is a kind of a public house. It's for, 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 for folk to come in. It is not a temple because difficult to, for all definitions of temple, it will be difficult to follow but a public house that creates services for people to meet, to talk, to discuss, to uh, uh, solve disputes. Anything what, you know, in the later periods, you have these public spaces in which disputes can be solved, things can be done. And that's what we call these assembly houses. So we have 24 of them across the, the site, but they are located in a, in a particular way. They are not part of these circuits. They're at 90 degrees to that. And we think they have a major, major planning principles in that. They are kind of, you know, making, they serve as an orienteer, to orientate yourself in that huge place. This is kind of a where communities, if you imagine, because we are thinking that if it's an assembly, so people come from somewhere else. So this is, will be their point. You know where to go because you have these kind of houses. So they're really related to the, to the quarters. Each of these quarters have these assembly houses. Moving forward now to, to, the, uh, uh, to the, what kind of political organization you think. So we did not excavate many houses at Nebelivka because our, our aim was to make holistically to um, get as many um, radiocarbon dense as possible, which means that we had to do test pits across the whole site. But what other colleagues have done on other sites is to excavate year after year after year to excavate sites. So from our own excavations, from these excavations of these various sites, we know that there is a very little difference between what is excavated. If I have to qualify that, it will be a, a difference of a degree rather than difference of a kind. So there is absolutely nothing to suggest that there is a car accusation, or it was not materialized. If there was, there was no way for us to find any hierarchy on the basis of what we were excavating. On the contrary, there was a kind of which are more communal, like communal feasting, as I mentioned earlier. So there was nothing for us to suggest um, other than heterarchical, egalitarian society. And last thing which I wanted to add is that they... We, well, one way of finding whether the society was hierarchical is graves, burials. Right. There's no burials, uh, like I said. There's more like no, burials no. of houses oh. almost rather there than are, yes, people. Yes, that's what we were thinking. Yeah. Exactly. That's what we are suggesting, that some of these some of these burning of houses may relate exactly, instead of the person, you're burying the house as, as the, the house is the epitome of some important person of the house, head of the household or something may have been related to that. And I have to just for your listeners to who uh, want fact checking, 
there are some burials towards the, the, the tail end of the group. So it's not that they don't, they, they start to appear, but there are centuries and centuries and centuries which there is nothing again, so which makes it even more difficult to uh, uh, to call that society hierarchical because simply we don't have uh, uh, we don't have any evidence to prove it. And no remains in the burned houses. No human remains no. in the burned houses. Wow, yeah. interesting. And it's that's fascinating yeah. because we think of sedentary societies as starting to really have cemeteries. So I, I do feel like then going to your model of it being sort of seasonal aggregations or a pilgrimage center mm-hmm. with a small group of residents, um, this takes me totally back to our discussions about what Chaco Canyon is as a central place. And, and we'll talk yeah. a little more about that later, but I feel like we are seeing, you know, more and more of uh, these, these models of ways that large groups of people could maybe be organized that don't have to rely on hierarchy, um, a top down, a central place. So what I want to, ask you then is is that um, for people to live or visit these sites or stay there for portions of a year or a season they have to imagine themselves as part of a larger community and you talk a little bit about imagined communities and some of the other things you've um, written and that's a that's a phrase that has has once it was introduced into anthropology I think a lot of people have found a lot of value in it because that idea of conceiving of yourself as part of something, larger a society beyond a a kin group or a household unit where you have shared norms, customs, beliefs, ceremonial, ritual behavior. I'm also thinking, you know, to organize that many people to build one of those very large structures that you talked about the engineering. I always think of this whenever I think of these, these structures that are engineered to be something more than utilitarian, right? It doesn't, you don't need a temple. You don't need, you know, the plaza space is just open, but these ceremonial or assembly houses, um, they have a uniformity to them and they, they almost look like just bigger versions of residential structures, which again reminds me of Chaco Canyon and and the, the Chaco and Great Houses being sort of like the unit Pueblos on steroids, you know, yeah. and so and and finding like you have a Kiva with every little Pueblo that might be dispersed. But then in the Great Houses, you have lots of these Kivas, which we know is like you talked about altars in the assembly houses. So it's, it's very interesting to think about as places of assembly um, periodically. And again, you know, not finding a lot of special items in them. It just doesn't seem like we have any way to, to find that hierarchy that we might expect. So talk a little bit about then, because it seems then that this is one of the first places on the planet where people widespread over this Tropian Plain, this big larger forest step area north of the Black Sea, share a culture and norm. But then at some point they decide to physically you know, make these sites that are all oval, that all have similar shaped houses with similar shaped contents, and then all contain some of these ultra large assembly houses and all have a central area that doesn't have anything in it. And, and what does that say about how people are beginning to think about themselves um, in relation to the people around them in relation to their territory and in relation to others, maybe. So give us your thoughts on that. You see, one thing which Tripilia is unique is that, A, it is distributed uh, on an area which covers 225,000 square meters. I was meaning before that I would run out of time to check which of the states, of the, of the United States, is that big to give a sign to the, to the listeners. So apologies that I haven't done that. But it, that it, it is very big, okay? So this is one key thing. And the other key thing is that Tripilia lasted for 2,000 years. So think of the common era, as you say, that you say in the USA. We have been 2,000 years. So that's how long they lasted. This is an enormously long, an enormously big entity, which is in parallel in prehistoric Europe. The United States is just a couple hundred years. I mean, so like just for perspective, like the sense of identity. So there's a deep history of what it means to probably be from that area. Exactly. And obviously we always wanted, we we, we were kind of 
trying to figure out what is the social glue. What is this thing that actually keeps these people so you can recognize that these are these people rather than other groups? Because no, may no mistake, there are other groups around them. It's not that there are no other groups. There are other groups. But And the, the, the other groups come and go, come and go. These continue to last and they are really very, with internal changes, of course there are changes, but they're unre- you will recognize. Yeah, yeah. there was a fluctuations that, yeah. Yeah. The, so and that's why we came up with this term, which probably you could have seen, which is the big other, which is kind of a symbolic order. If you wish, if it's kind of an ideology or belief system, which is within which that gives the parameters, that gives the sense, the rules, what is the right thing to do and how to live. OK, so that's but in the same time in that also allows for diversity. So that's why you have these various different groups around because it's not a, like a, a schismatic. So he says, oh, that's it. And if you move out of that, so there is this flexibility of, of, the, um, of the way you can conduct your life or do your own um, settlement, choose different kind of things, but in the same time, keep, uh, keep the... Um, the overall, the overall continuity. Rules. So probably intermarriage, it's, some mobility, all correct. those things would help keep it. Yeah, exactly. And this is the key. You mentioned, started to mention this. Uh, why so big these sites? Precisely. You, you meant intermarriage. You, yeah. These are the kind of things pe- people do. And I am convinced in that, uh, that, you know, there were informal meetings, informal meetings of different size of people. And then the, that size of people, the group started to enlarge and enlarge, and enlarge. And at a certain point, we said, okay, so why don't we formalize this? So why we why are we doing this like that? Why don't we actually do it more formally? We build some houses. And in each of three the, the three models, this is valid. So this is a kind of assembly. This is kind of a coming together to do exactly the same, that, the things that you said, to fairs, uh, to, uh, exchange of uh, resources of any kind because if you I live here you live there we, we have salt and you have something else we always do the exchange M- marriage partners all what you think about interaction human interaction would have taken place in these areas and this is what actually define them and that's why we're going back to the urbanity of things so what do we what do we think is urban these days is this exactly this a center of services if, if things which you cannot have on your small village you can eat, drink, and whatever, but you do not have these interactions. You do not have that many different specialists that you can see. You don't have that many people from which you can choose a bride if you wish. So all the things that you, you, you can do if you have more of them is what happens there. You have more scales, more times more than what you have on your small side. And this is what, you know. Uh, uh, Isn't this uh, is. now also kind of a similar model to what really people are talking about around Stonehenge and all around mm-hmm. there? Because now they're finding, you know, <laughs> sheep that grew up in like northern Scotland Scotland's? are being all Scotland's? already there. And then the blue stones <laughs> that came all the way from Wales, that's a heck of a Say, thing to drag yes, all that way. Yes. But that there must have been these. And we have Durrington Walls, we have the other uh, where we know people were living, but that the site itself was was probably something that brought people together for these periodic... Yeah. And it's a similar scale when you're looking at all of that. So, so it's exactly. turning out that this model of interaction in these early European farming areas is, is something... That well, it you accomplishes, I mean, yeah, yes, yeah, what yeah. people need to accomplish. That, that even Yubikli has that kind of attraction from um, uh, along uh, of a huge area, uh, what we call a catchment area, and yeah, this is and this is uh, this suggests a lot of mobility around. So I mean, again, it's maybe not your standard mobility of a which is colonization, but it is back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, which we kind of never really considered seriously in prehistory because we thought okay once you go there you stay there you don't move or you or you move all the time but nothing in between nothing in between that you actually can be uh, you, you can have your settlement but you also will have these regional centers to which you go and you you absolutely need to go for uh to uh, to re- reestablish your um order or what we call the big other kind of take some inspiration to say, oh, what, what's new? What has been, uh, has this ritual change 
or do now we have uh, do we slaughter animals in a different way or do we now put this kind of uh, ornaments rather than this kind of ornaments? It is yeah. how do we paint our pots? But it's this yeah. coming together. It's not paying a tax. It's not redistributing. It's yeah. it's this very much more kind of democratized yeah. with a with a under. I mean, even the oval shape of the yeah. the site seems to suggest that more so egalitarian so. framework. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, go hard with, with your yeah. next question, Crystal. So is- we're so we're gonna move a little bit away from from structures and go to clay. We're gonna talk a little bit about clay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so clay was really an important part of life at these Trapillion settlements, and it was not only used to build structures like we talked about with the houses, but also to manufacture figurines. Um, Figurines, you have some beautiful diagrams of figurines, and then um, these little house um, figurines as well. Also, large painted vessels, um, these beautiful vessels that you have some photographs as well. So tell us about the innovations made in pottery production and what role that played in the economic life of these residents of these mega sites. Or visitors too, or yeah, whatever. Well, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, if, if I usually, when I go uh, across the world, I usually present this as a world of clay. And you're absolutely right about that. And it's not because they haven't used other materials. I mean, we know that they used flame, they used metal. It's not that they didn't didn't use that kind of, but obviously they were obsessed with clay. And these uh, vessels are so beautiful. And and some of the symmetries there that are produced are uh, three-way symmetries, which are really, really, uh, you have particular cognitive, uh, you have to have particular cognitive abilities to be able to create these patterns, which only Escher has reproduced millennia after that so this is really really amazing and so yes and then mm, the figurines which are they're they're, they're kind of two types of figurines if i could put it that way so one of these very standardized figurines in which um we kind of tend to interpret as showing a group identity as opposed to these other figurines which have more features of a of of Portrait features of it, or showing emotions, or showing some gestures, and we kind of think that they are to portray some kind of personal identity. So there is this, you know, uh, debate about uh, uh, discourse, if you wish, between kind of images uh, uh, in Trapelia. And uh, one major change in pottery was to go from the, to massive. The first, it was kind of incised decoration, but they changed the decoration. Speaking of what they did when they go together, what is the new fashion? So they've changed to a painted pottery. So that's uh, one of the major changes that took place from uh, in, in, uh, incised to uh, painted pottery. And uh, also, crucially, with time, they started to produce vessels which are bigger, which we think that they are probably related to feasting because you would need more of whatever the content of these things were. It was also maybe to store them or to display them or to be for more people. So this is an, another change that we see on the mega site. So that's obviously more people, more you know, feasting rituals. So. And a third uh, 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 way of innovation, we don't, we are not quite sure about Nebulivka, but for sure is in the other two, Mega sites that are close by, 20 kilometers away, uh, Maidanesco and Tilinki, they have kilns. So, and they have kilns, quite a lot of them. So, which is again for massive, that, that's a massive production of, of, of pots. Uh, this is really scaling up uh, uh, the production of, uh, of very fine and very beautiful pot. And that obviously that has implications. Who is doing it? How many people? Where the, the where the where the clay comes from? So you you name it, you understand that. That's the, uh, huge because then you're wondering too, like, mm-hmm. is that only seasonally if they aggregate, or there's somebody resident that's not feeding themselves? They're just making pots, that's, and that becomes that's, that's a whole so different see, level of yeah, yeah. fascinating you see, question. You start yeah thinking of that. So we say, where do we start? So you see, we we are only scratching the surface. We are really in the beginning of understanding these sites. If you start asking these questions, you know, taking one one line of inquiry seeing what that will show you, but then starting with another one, this will show, and we have to bring all of these narratives together. I mean, as I say, we're in the beginning, simply because our main struggle has been to break down the traditional view of this side, uh, the same, only bigger, you know, and we really wanted to introduce the question of scale is very important, 
that it is one thing to live on a 20 uh, or 10 hectare site. And it's very different to be 10 times that. Imagine, I don't know where the, the, the places where I live and imagine them there, whatever, uh, 200, uh, uh, whatever, uh, houses or whatever. Imagine 10 times that. And what are the implications of that? So this is, again, I couldn't, we couldn't possibly uh, uh, um, go in, 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 in everything in one particular podcast, but I would love to tell you about it. I know, I, <laughs> we, we'll have to keep following you and do yeah. more. Is it true that there, that there, some of the figurines, there tends to be um, representations sort of of, the, of a female form more so, or is there any indication of that being maybe somehow related to a larger ceremonial or belief system, a, a, a more feminine form or of deity or something? Well, uh, there are certainly a lot of Ukrainians who believe that this is a kind of a pantheon. So they really devise a pantheon of various uh, deities or various things that you can possibly see. I tend not to see that because it is obviously they follow Gimbutas in that uh, in, in that which Maria Gimbutas, yeah, okay, exactly, which which is which is uh, sure. a legitimate sure. a legitimate way to follow. I simply see that there are too many exceptions, if you want, to the rule to make that work. Because okay, that's very good, but then how do you explain all these other figurines which are not doesn't fit do not fit in that way? And if you come up with a credible explanations of that accommodate not only the pretty and very, yeah, very feminine, very, and the others which are standardized, as I said, they have no faces. They just have a stump. So what are these then? And okay, you can probably figure out that this is maybe a, you know, female body. Their legs are like, uh, uh, like mermaids. They go like pointed out. So what do they mean? You know, so when I see that they are incorporated in that narrative, I'm prepared to listen to it. For the time being, I prefer that kind of, as what I suggested, this kind of identity, which is more of a, because, you know, if you have many which looking exactly the same, well, maybe that is a representative of a group, a way, some kind of, yeah. or maybe also because there are various uh, dress, you, know, you, you can also make that sort of teaching device. Yeah, you can have many, many different uh uh, explanation and particularly not from the from from Ukraine but from Romania, I have developed a, a different explanation for a set of figurines which were found in a in a pot. But that's another podcast. And we okay, talk okay. About yeah. yeah. About that I one. mean, that and, and these yeah. same <laughs> questions revolve in the Paleolithic period as yeah. well. So it seems like there's a lot of that looking looking for what some of this means. Um, I uh, I find that fascinating, and I and I couldn't help but being struck by some of the parallels of I see with the way people have tried to explain in in very polar opposite terms what Chaco Canyon is, that it's some sort of hierarchical center that rules with fear and violence, or it's a center that's a pilgrimage center for this whole hinterland where periodically people get together and there really isn't much difference in in material wealth between people. There may have been people who had more specialized ritual knowledge and things like that, and that you periodically had people get together to create these structures and add on to them because that kept happening over time. They were never like a done deal. And yeah. you clearly have evidence of feasting. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated um, by that model uh, of pilgrimage center. And it seems like that's one that you, um, you seem to favor. Um, so tell us a little bit about how that's being received by, by people. Um, as you Funny you should say that this is the least accepted model of all of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about you? Know? Of course. Yeah. Uh, because this is really something which prehistoric Europe has troubles dealing with because this is something which obviously comes with historical periods, later periods, or maybe Bronze Age. They, that These are the kind of things that you can, for, for whatever reason, it's more acceptable for the later periods. But when it comes for what is basically uh, Copper Age or, or Neolithic, that kind of, because there is nothing before that. There is nothing before that to suggest that this is a credible way to interpret these things. But, but, You've you've looked at the plan. So don't you see that some of these routes can be really like a processional route? 
they're specifically made to channel movement in a particular just way. like chaco and roads leading exactly. towards these things in the plaza areas i mean it's, it's different exactly but and when we'll be so yeah. yeah yes either either will be a, 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 a around between the two circuits and then homing in into the into the um the, the, the central empty area these are a lot of the planning makes sense if it's a highly ceremonial, highly uh, um, uh, poignant way of movement, which is, you know, if you look around, what is the on uh, the, the, that we see that kind of behavior? Well, people going to San Marco now, or to Santiago de Compostela, or going to the Hajj. This is the kind of thing that you have a very constructive, very constrained movement with a lot of meaning in that for which we you know very little but uh this is for us a really screaming in the face that this is obviously one of the possibilities yeah yeah and but, there's an inside uh, and an outside yeah. and there's no big tall altar in the middle there's multiple assembly houses so yeah, yeah for yeah. me it seems like a um a, a very viable model to be tested and, and one that makes yeah. sense yeah yeah I can't agree with you more, <laughs> but you know that's why we have these uh, ha- have these presentations and other colleagues. So hopefully people will pick up and then you know the the, the problem is that in the middle we so just uh, opening that. I know that we are uh, running out of time very quickly. Uh, we made a lot of investigations in the middle of that area, trying to find something, anything, anything, empty, empty, empty. We tried, you name it, we tried it. It's just nothing. So the only thing that we can think is that really they cherish that empty space for them to be together, to do their their, uh, 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 their rituals, which will be chanting, dancing. Uh, and maybe there will be a little bit of, uh, uh, of stalls around. Right. Yeah. 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 But, but they definitely is, wanted to keep it yeah. clean because think about how keep hard it, it is to keep any know, place keep clean. Place. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. people are there eating and walking they through. Just, well, and that's that's right. Somebody maintained yeah. it as a clean space. They kept it clear. And those big yeah. pits filled with everything else. Yeah. That's yeah. actually yeah. fascinating yeah. to think about just that intentional behavior in, in and of itself. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah, so let's so, bring this to the present. Crystal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so um, the Ukraine has really been in our hearts and minds yeah. over these past two months. Um, we can only imagine the horrors going on now in so many parts of Ukraine as Russian forces continue to attack. Tell me about it. I mean, I'm losing sleep over that. So, yes. Yeah. 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 But the, the good thing is that uh, the, the, so they are not, they're concentrated. Some of them are concentrated between uh, the Southern Book and uh, Dnieper. So Dnieper is that big river that uh, that goes out. That's main concentration. But there are others which are beyond that concentration. Luckily, none of them is directly threatened. So small mercies. I'm thankful for small mercies. And because they are, I mean, they are underground. There's nothing visible on the top. Again, I just pray that there will be no damage done to them. Uh, if, 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 if you don't know that they're there, you would not touch them. So I, I do really, really hope. For, for the sake of future generations, that they are safe. I was looking on yeah. maps and hoping that they were in a region that wasn't really facing the brunt of things right now. Um, yep. Bazirka, yep. this is such important work, and we know that potentially it's it's under threat or could become under threat. Um, and, and we wish you know you we wish all the ukrainians a, a swift end to this yeah. horrible conflict mm-hmm. um but just to finish what what would you most like people to know about the significance of these sites and the, and the research that you and others have conducted there how long do you have but i'll, I'll concentrate that Door first. takeaway yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, the the, 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 the only in my view european, european candidates for early, early urban, urban centers, centers even before the new ones they're also currently the Earlier, uh, um, earlier than the earliest urban sites in Rook and and um, um, in the near eastern sites in, in the yeah, they're even earlier, right? Mm-hmm. They they start earlier. And Manila is so yes. different in the beginning of the yes, in the beginning of the fourth millennium, exactly. Not in not in the second part of the fourth millennium. It's in the beginning of the fourth millennium. And they are also the earliest examples of the low density urbanism, which we couldn't talk about today, but we can probably talk some other time. I know, and I had that <laughs> word in there, that Roman word, opida, however you say it, and that will be another time. So yeah, <laughs> that will be another time. <laughs> okay. They also obviously uh, the uh, 
an example that complex society could be non-hierarchical. Yeah. And I think that's a very good example. Yeah. And therefore, I would I would argue that there are extraordinarily significant class of monuments that deserves for our, all our humankind, uh, human her, uh, urban heritage, not urban heritage, but I would mean the archaeological heritage. They are absolutely key uh, for our um, development of, 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 of how we live and how we decide that the intentional ways in which decide that this is a good way to go forward. And I think that they are very much overlooked. And I would really thank you for inviting me because hopefully more people know about it and more people will say, oh, okay then, all right then, and they will be no so un- overlooked anymore. I yeah, I, I love that they re- represent another way that humans can organize themselves and just pulling a page out of David Graeber and David Wengro's book. I think it gives hope to the sense that we can organize ourselves and it's not inevitable that we become increasingly yeah. unequal, even if there's a lot yeah. of us that are that are having to share resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, there's so much more we could talk about. Um, and hopefully next time. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just going to say we'll, we'll talk to you again about all these little tangents that we could go on. Um, because today, unfortunately, we've run out of time. But thank you so much for talking with us today. And we encourage everyone out there to find out more about your work, Berserka. And the book um, that you've written is called Early, or the book that you've edited is called Early Urbanism in Europe. The Tropilia Mega Sites of the Ukrainian Forest Steppe. And is that and it's open, open access? access. Yes, it's open, open, open access. access. So, you can yes. download yeah. it and go and download it. And you can see all these photographs of, amazing. that we've been talking about today. So um, thank you for making that open access. I was so excited to see that. <laughs> so um, we will definitely put a link to that in the show notes. But thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure, Bazurka. And we want to thank you and thanks to all our listeners out there for joining us today. If you love this podcast, please tell a friend and make sure to subscribe so that it shows up in your podcast feed each week. Leave us a review, only if it's a five-star review on Apple Podcasts (laughs) or Spotify, because we love those um, and it helps others find us. So thanks for listening today. And we hope that you can join us again to find out more about The the Dirt dirt on the past. Past. And a big thank you to our editor and sound guru, Steve Durbin. Thanks to Lost and Alegria for mixing the music and to John Chadwell for helping get this podcast out in the world. Mm